So there is a risk of having that value being reduced to a dollar figure, and, and, and obviously that doesn't make sense to everybody, or to most people, as it, as it shouldn't. Um, ecosystems are not, are not a commodity, um, but we also need to recognize how, how they support human well-being, how they support the economy, and so by providing an estimation of what that represents in a market economy, then, then we're informing those discussions in that way. Um, on the conceptual, the conceptual gap between ecosystem services and biodiversity, obviously that's a, that's a big challenge. Um, we're, we're finally, uh, you know, at, at IUCN, in, in our attempts to, to generate more partnerships, to generate more interest in biodiversity conservation, that that concept is not, uh, um, is not an easy sell um, for, for, for people who are, not, who are not as interested as IUCN might be in conserving biodiversity. It's very, it's very abstract. It's very broad. We're talking about diversity of, of, with you know, genes, species, and ecosystems. It applies everywhere. It's you know the diversity of life on Earth. Um, so that's why you know we use ecosystem services. We adapt our language. We talk about natural capital, uh, different ways of communicating about biodiversity values because biodiversity in itself is just is just too intangible. So the answer to that, how to fill that gap, is basically you know adapt adapt the language to the different stakeholders, and that's why I personally think that this ecosystem service concept does have quite a bit of mileage. Um, then just a few words on on TEAB. Um, well, first of all, I agree. You know, carbon market is strong, and red itself is is not ripe. Um, I think yeah, I do I do think we need we need more time. Um, as I said, I, I'm, I'm still on the fence. I'm not really sure how such a global system could, could work, but it does boil down to the local level. Um, it, it, it's something that, that, that seems difficult to imagine, especially bearing in mind that the limits that, it, that it's had, that PS has had at the national level in places such as Costa Rica, I think Mexico has maybe been a bit more successful, but, but we still have a lot of learning to do. Um, so I, I would agree with you that that we're maybe not right. That right. Um, and in terms of balancing the trade-offs, for example, between carbon and, and water, how do we how do we make sure that red is not incentivizing eucalyptus plantations or even in Indonesia palmo plantations? Uh, that is a real trade-off. I think I think on the one hand it's important that red is not simply about um, preserving uh, existing forests and saying, okay, we're gonna we're gonna reward those countries that are able to reduce their deforestation by preserving intact forests. I think it's important that it's also seen as, as an incentive for enhancing carbon stock so that people that are able to invest in restoring degraded landscapes or or, or uh, basically give more room for entrepreneurs, people that, that can enhance carbon stocks are also to be included in this because at the end of the day the interest is in biomass, it, it's in carbon sequestration. And I think that you do get more additional benefits by allowing those types of projects, restoration, avoided degradation. That's why it's important that, that the discussion has evolved there. But obviously you need to be careful that it doesn't go into credits for, for monoculture plantations. And so that's why there have been quite a few efforts at doing safeguards, social safeguards and biodiversity safeguards. Some will say that the safeguard approach is maybe too restrictive and, and, and not the right way to go. Um, again, I think the, you know these are these are discussions that are, that are relatively recent, um, and I think that those trade-offs are definitely well recognized, especially between uh, the plantations, between having a broad definition of red and, and not incentivizing the wrong types of land uses, and also recognizing that you have to balance the different ecosystem services. Forests are more than stocks of carbon. I think that message has come across pretty well in, in the climate change community, thanks notably to the involvement of conservation organizations. Um, and so that you know, we're, we're, we we do want to make sure that we're not undermining water-related ecosystem services with carbon. I think we, we're, we're heading in, in the right way there. Um, on T, it's evidence on the values, not not the prices. T basically just is a compilation of all these different valuation studies, such as the one we've done in in, in Burkina Faso and things that have been done everywhere. Efforts at, at trying to put uh, you know a, an overall estimation. On Ecosystems compiled up, put into different, uh, into into a new structure, condensed, and then shown to the world. Listen, this is what, this is what uh, biodiversity conservation means in economic terms. The 30 to 40 million figures is for protected areas, and I think it's what's estimated is missing 
uh, to effectively manage the, 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 the network of protected areas that we have around the world. It's not meant to, to, sh to say this is how much biodiversity is worth worldwide. There, you know, there was an attempt in 1997, Costanza and his colleagues put a price like three trillion, I can't really remember what it was, this is what the world's ecosystem <coughs> services are worth. That, you know, that hasn't been picked up very. You know, people recognize that that's something that is too abstract. Um, uh, again, you know, it's, it's, it's about highlighting the values to the different, to, to different stakeholders using using these values really as just a piece of ammunition in, 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 in lobbying efforts and in awareness raising and in communication. I think that's really what, what TEAB is for. We'll see how, how, it's, how prominent it, it, it is featured in, in Rio. I'm not sure, I mean, I, I saw it really as an effort that was meant to be showcased and disseminated in, as it was last year in the context of the CBD discussions. Now it's basically, okay, from, from the environmental community's perspective, people that put together this T study, okay, we've given you the evidence, now you, you use it or not, and if you want to use it, we'll, we'll help you do it. And green economy really is about um, you know, using that to do things such as reforming systems of national accounts, thinking about reforming fiscal policies, um, trying to make a change how you're doing your, who you're, who you're subsidizing and who you're taxing, uh, those, those types of things, operationalizing T. I I think that really is, what this green economy agenda is about. So I see, I see it as heading in the right direction. Again, valuation. Does it make you know if it makes sense? Yeah, it, it, I, I think it does. But I think that those who are not aware of its limits um, are, are are obviously misguided, and that's a very important risk. I, mean, I, I would also like to make a comment before we have to break up. Um, you drop for the actual implementation of IPS, you dropped a few names like biodiversity offsets or certification or auctioning yeah. landscapes or something. Um, I think for for IPS to be really successful or be picked up by policymakers, that implementation has to become more concrete. Um, to be to for the idea to be sold. Um, it, it, it's like exactly those things that I think needs to be um, needs more work mm -hmm. and more concreteness. It's just a yeah. comment. Yeah, like this, it's kind of a very uh, uh, an idea that's just floating in the air and uh, and, 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 and that has nothing, not much to hold on. Yeah. There, but there, you know, I mentioned those in passing, and I insisted more on these these piggybacking or bundling or auction, these ideas that, that are seen as being somewhat different because biodiversity offsets you know, exist independently of, of, of IPS. Eco-labeling, certification, habitat banking, these different types of schemes um, exist sort of independently of this PES model that we have and that we use to refer to examples of of Costa Rica, of New York, of New York City, of, of so they're, they're in my view, um, you know, if we, if we want to use IPS as something that 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 has potential, um, then it's not sufficient to just have it be an umbrella for covering all the wide forms of existing conservation finance. Um, I think it needs it needs to be something different. Okay, maybe there's uh, like. Five minutes left, just for final comments or questions, but very brief ones. So. I have one more question, and you mentioned that there's a conceptual mismatch in your presentation between um, the classification used by the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment Report and sort of the framing used by the BS community and others. And I wonder from, because you, you follow the negotiations of the CPD, I wonder whether um, this sort of conceptual mismatch is also might be one of the reasons why it hasn't been taken up so so quickly, or whether it's just sort of an academic debate that is because even within the pest community, some people use environmental services, yeah. ecosystem services, some frame them like environmental services as part of ecosystem services, or others the other way around. I just wonder what what sort of that implication is. Um, yeah, that's an excellent question. Uh, 
within the within the conservation community, there's very different appreciations of what ecosystem services means. For someone like myself, who is interested in, in payments for ecosystem services and using it as a means of, of, of supporting conservation finance, I have a different appreciation than somebody who is not at all interested in the economic aspects. And I think, and, and that's why you, you'll have it in, in the scientific literature such broad uses of, of the ecosystem services concept, different typologies, different characterizations. Um, so it's difficult, and I think that, yeah, the, the the broad scope for understanding ecosystem services has not helped it in terms of, of it being seen as a, a, a useful way of, of being able to capitalize more on, on, on ecosystem values, on, on natural capital. Um, and so so it's not, it, it's still difficult to say thinking back in, in, those, in those discussions on innovative financing mechanisms, why some parties would say, let's forget about them. I don't think they're necessarily too concerned about the terminology of, of using. They don't have anything against, for example, payments for ecosystem services, I think, as a, as a concept. It's just more generally the concern about um, what it means to be using market-based approaches and, and the, the risks very legitimate that are associated with that. Great. Well, thank you all for coming. For um for your questions, for your nice presentation, for the good discussion, and um, I think we close this event now. Thanks Thank a lot. Much. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, David will be around this afternoon, so if, if there's anything else you want to discuss, um, I don't know where you will be sitting. <laughs>